morning. We are starting our, um, our program on the 31st of uh, July. Tomorrow, the Russian Federation, um, starting from tomorrow, the Russian Federation bans import of fruits and vegetables uh, from, uh, from Poland. Um, uh, and this is a symmetrical uh, response of uh, Ross Patriot and on the unbecoming actions of the Polish uh, mm, the party. Let me start with uh, the agenda of today, and she will tell us a couple of uh, a couple of uh, remarks. Good morning. First of all, I would like to introduce you to two um, remarkable experts of this school who will uh, host uh, a most important uh, lecture uh, on uh, the uh, so called latent in the expression of uh, Mr. Zaharov. Um, federative structures in this country. Andrei Zakharov is one of the most celebrated experts on federalism in Russia. And I um, would like, also like to introduce uh, you to another um, um, participant of this uh, discussion, Miguel Bertrand de Felipe, who has. Uh, uh, been present at his presentation in Segovia uh, when, when, when we held the seminar. I'm not an expert um, in the administrative law and I'm not a jurist, uh, but I was, uh, um, I was uh, very much impressed uh, by Miguel's um, Presentation about uh, Spain's uh, progress after Franco. It was uh, an almost a destitute country uh, after um, years of harsh dictatorship. It was uh, almost destitute politically and economically. But the Spaniards were able to. Um, step over their own emotions and uh, they were able to sign this uh, celebrated Makloa Pact, which uh, led uh, all political, religious, uh, and uh, anti dictatorship forces uh, to reconciliation, including some of the civil servants from the Pan Franco government. Um, uh, whereupon they sat at uh, the table of uh, negotiations and they sat to negotiate, which began uh, the um, process of uh, the democratic transit of uh, Spain. What happened to us? in the perestroika years, and this might have been the only possible uh, scenario, we did not use any of the tools and the instruments that we were given, and we did not understand what are we, uh, what could we do with the freedom, something that the Spaniards uh, did. And this uh, is uh, my impression uh, from his presentation. Um, usually, uh, amazingly, these uh, presentations of ministers of law in Spain uh, sounded to me almost as poetry. And what they really did uh, is they transposed uh, the freedoms uh, into the municipal and uh, regional um, uh, life. They emphasized and uh, created the uh, regional life in uh, Spain, which of course uh, um, is uh, quite difficult and mosaic, but uh, they were able to emphasize and to put the emphasis on uh, the regional uh, and municipal um, formations, whereby um, 
uh, the Spanish uh, regions and municipalities have the right uh, to have uh, direct relations with Brussels, Madrid, or even Moscow. Mm, this is the kind of freedom that the Spanish regions have, uh, and they may even mm, uh, suffer to a degree from this wide autonomy, and they may even be reviewing uh, some of these uh, some of these uh, uh, concepts, but uh, for many years uh, they were practically realizing uh, the freedom that they inherited. We shall not be talking about this experience um, as a lesson that we need uh, to, uh, to take, but we will uh, try to see how a nation may efficiently use uh, uh, may efficiently use the freedoms that this nation has uh, uh, has uh, inherited. Uh, I would also like to introduce you to our great friend uh, and uh, um, great uh, linguist and interpreter Alexander Kasachkov. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, one of our great uh, uh, Russian Spanish experts uh, and the desert, uh, and he can be there for two hours in the interpreter's cabin. Thank you, Sasha. which will take me about uh, 40 minutes um, by the number of, uh, of slides that I have. Uh, um, what is the sense of this, uh, um, the meaning of this presentation? When our motherland started to inspire the Ukraine with the um, ideas of federalism, uh, I thought that many of our citizens may not be particularly aware of what we're talking about because we live in a federative uh, state which hardly practices um, federalist attitudes, um, uh, moods, uh, or indeed a legal framework at the same time trying to instill the notion of federalism into others. So I thought that uh, we might have uh, an introduction to the topic and to tell you these words, federation, federalism, federative nature, uh, in the constitution of the Russian Federation. So uh, this uh, will be uh, an introduction uh, to uh, the topic. In my view, uh, this is uh, the most important characteristic of Russia as a federation. It's a federation without federalism. And uh, to elucidate uh, this uh, um, thought, uh, I have um, shown, I'm showing this, uh, this uh, painting by Magritte, uh, which says, C'est le bazon pipe, whereby this is not a pipe, but this is not a smoking pipe, so indeed uh, this is exactly the kind of surrealist state where we live, uh, you know, which is a federation, but not a federation uh, in uh, reality. As a political scientist, I'm thinking about this uh, more and more, and uh, the picture that comes up to me is that we're not alone. In the world, there is a, a considerable group of countries which call themselves uh, uh, federative uh, states, but uh, are not federations. Uh, and in such countries, uh, um, people hardly know how to act. Uh, 
um, in the federative way. Uh, usually these are countries of the so-called global periphery, so we can move forward. So the federalism can be used in a, in a proper way or an improper way. It can be used for the um, wrong purposes. But uh, what does, uh, what follows from this fact? This doesn't mean in itself that this is a, a senseless thing, because if you do not use federalism uh, to devolve power, that does not mean that you cannot turn the federalism to your use. Uh, we uh, are aware of cases when the federalism was used uh, uh, for uh, uh, for wrong purposes. I shall try to uh, uh, give you several examples. One of the examples which I think uh, will uh, enthuse Maria, um, and the example from the Spanish uh, modern history. One can promise uh, federalism, but then uh, pull it back, pull the promise back. Um, at one point, uh, the uh, uh, Chinese uh, 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 rulers uh, were advocating federalism, but then um, departed from it. Mao Zedong did uh, exactly that. He promised federalism to the national minorities. So once the communists won, and when the communists did win, they never remembered uh, um, the ideas of federalism. The national minorities were hardly given anything, and Maria will object to me, uh, talking about the autonomous regions in China, but this is not quite uh, the same. Let me give another example. In 1945, when uh, Germany was under the uh, rebuilding uh, federative, uh, um, the federative composition of Germany was uh, interestingly advanced by the French. Uh, the French, a nation which had never had any federative uh, kind of uh, arrangement, and the French thought that a federative Republic of Germany would be uh, a weak Germany, and that the best thing is uh, to make Germany uh, a weak a federative state that would never have perpetrated the world war again. And uh, indeed, uh, this was uh, viewed as a taming of, uh, of Germany. Mr. Sarkashvili thought in the same way. Under Mr. Sarkashvili, the different projects of federalization of Georgia were criticized because they would weaken uh, the Georgian state, they would make um, the, the Georgian state uh, extremely vulnerable, and either the Turks or the Russians were imposing uh, these uh, kinds of, um, of things uh, on uh, uh, on Georgia. So federalism is viewed by many as a synonym uh, of weakness. Uh, this um, uh, amazing gentleman is Ivan Ilyin, the Russian philosopher who died in 1954. Uh, many uh, read, uh, his uh, widely read, uh, and federalism in his view was uh, the illness of chaos. Federalism is in no way um, is in no way um, the kind of arrangement for Russia. And uh, Georgi Fedotov, who had an inclination to the left and was a social democrat, uh, Mr. Ilyin was a conservative um, and almost a hawkish uh, philosopher. This quotation uh, from, uh, from uh, philosopher Ilyin uh, testifies uh, to his unwillingness to accept a federative arrangement for Russia as, uh, uh, as a um, model for development. This quotation is quite illustrative because uh, philosopher Ilyin believed uh, that uh, for Russia, and diversity of Russia was not, uh, was not uh, uh, put under doubt, uh, he believed that the the only way for this diverse country is the imperial government. And uh, he criticized federalism. If you take uh, his uh, collection of works, um, you will see that uh, he is always uh, criticizing the federative idea and he is criticizing the, 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 the horrors of uh, Latin American um, federalism. Look at the horrors in Latin America. No, just look at the wars in Latin America. This is what he called uh, the inefficient and uh, servile uh, invitation of Europe. What did he criticize them for? First of all, he said that the Latin Americans used uh, copy paste as a method of uh, state building. They took uh, the U.S. Constitution, uh, they changed some words, and um, used it as the only instrument uh, which uh, he did not have uh, any particular foundations. So then, 
when we are looking at federalism in, in uh, Latin America. And by the way, uh, there are four major federations, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, Argentina, and Mexico, uh, two, four great uh, federative states. Uh, so um, we see yet another interesting uh, case. In Latin America, the federative idea is in a paradoxical way uh, combined with uh, dictatorship. Um, it is uh, not uh, infrequent that the dictators uh, did not abolish the so-called federative arrangement when they came to power, which in a way speaks uh, uh, to the benefit of uh, federalism uh, as a, or, uh, as a uh, way of authoritarian instrument. Uh, at the same time, most of these uh, were believed uh, to be uh, low level of, of federations where the subjects of the federation played a very uh, insignificant role. But uh, the tendency uh, can be seen as such. Uh, for instance, the Mexican Constitution implies that the federal bodies uh, may default from um, the regional bodies, and the regional bodies uh, uh, cannot do anything about this. And uh, the constitution of mid 20th century in, in Mexico allowed for such abuse of power on the, on the part of the federal authorities. Uh, uh, thus, uh, there was no uh, relation between federalism and democracy, and this is what philosopher Elian spoke about also. Uh, why do we need a federalism if we don't have uh, a democracy? But if you look uh, at this uh, more closely, you'll see that there is some, uh, some sense uh, in this arrangement. I have uh, several uh, cases. Uh, let me take the case of Brazil. Brazil is a federation starting from the end of the 19th century, and uh, for 40 years, uh, Brazil, um, Brazil is one of the largest states, Sao Paulo, um, tripled its population and increased its GDP uh, almost tripled. Brazil was a federation which allowed um, the constitution of uh, 1891 to um, uh, levy fees uh, from imported goods. And uh, the state of uh, Sao Paulo being a very sensible isolationist, if I may use the word in the framework of federation, made uh, uh, a very unitary um, a federation. It would it would really be very difficult to, to imagine Brazil as a, a unitary state, um, and so in this sense, uh, the federative uh, uh, arrangement uh, did contribute uh, to the development of the regions. Um, and of course, Brazil as a uh, uh, as an, a huge country had a temptation uh, to build a unitary um, so-called vertical of, of a power or authority and uh, one of these uh, attempts uh, in the 20th century led uh, to the so-called new state of Lovacus, um, a kind of dictatorship uh, um, and indeed this is what we saw in uh, many um, of uh, these areas such as uh, the um, Replacement of the governors. So it ended up with that in two years, so the state of Sao Paulo was trying uh, to, um, and the regions are trying to persuade uh, the federal center. And in 1932, um, Sao Paulo uh, was uh, engulfed um, by the civil unrest and the militia of Sao Paulo, which stood the pressure of the federal army. In 1934, a new constitution. Uh, the rebels uh, had been um, had been defeated, but uh, the government was not able to build up this vertical power in the way uh, that they had wanted. So the federative arrangement was retained, and the upper chamber of the parliament also stayed intact. For the Amer Latin American scenarios, I have uh, taken uh, some of the paintings of Fernando Potero. Um, and I think they're quite uh, um, illustrative. I think that uh, if you live in Santa Francisco, uh, you may uh, uphold the Federation. Uh, but uh, the Latin American experience shows us differently. Um, the weak are interested uh, in uh, the Federation as much as the strong um, uh, region subjects, because uh, we're talking about the unequal uh, representation of the regions. 
from this standpoint, it is uh, interesting to consider the case of uh, Argentina, where such inequality um, is very conspicuous. The Argentinian uh, Constitution of 1856, uh, which was uh, made after the U.S. Uh, models, uh, um, presupposed uh, the equality of the proportionality of the number of MPs with the population um, uh, of the particular subject of the Federation. But then uh, Peron uh, uh, violated uh, uh, this principle, and each province of Argentina uh, was only to get uh, two MP seats. Uh, it was then went up to three uh, seats, and then the leaving uh, Argentinian junta uh, um, uh, granted a five uh, seats uh, to all weak uh, subjects of the Federation. This is what uh, resulted uh, for four donor provinces, uh, which, uh, which account for 78 percent of the industrial um, uh, economy uh, and population of Argentina, have only half of the MP seats, whereas uh, the rest uh, are um, um, presented by the so called weak or accepted regions, which makes that the uh, weak subjects of the Federation become an extremely strong political force. Um, thereby um, creating a system of checks and balances and precluding the executive uh, from making, uh, um, from making uh, abrupt uh, uh, or um, harsh uh, uh, decisions. Uh, and this indeed holds the Federation together. Uh, philosopher Eileen uh, in my view, was wrong in criticizing the Latin America from the positions that he did. Indeed, uh, the creation of a federative system is always painful. However, it is the political framework uh, of a federation which allows for nurturing the so-called uh, economically beneficial and economically prosperous regions which then provide uh, for the overall development um, of the nation. And uh, in countries where the economic balance is particularly vivid, uh, the such federation allows it to cope and come to terms with such hardships. Uh, they bring uh, um, cohesion to the heterogeneous societies. And uh, this uh, allows me to come to Russia. I will try to speak uh, more slowly. This allows me to uh, uh, come uh, to Russia, and uh, while Latin America, uh, Latin America is a more or less ethnically heterogeneous society, so whereas Russia is uh, a multi-ethnic society, it is true, and for this very reason, the Federation is especially valuable for Russia because uh, the federalism is a kind of self-determination and it is especially um, favored by the small ethnic groups because it makes them, uh, um, it, it empowers them, um, it provides the empowerment to the weaker um, groups, uh, which is uh, what I spoke about uh, with respect to the Latin America. And this also leads to devolution of power. The diversity of societies uh, uh, is especially important. Federalism, in my view, is a pillar for those political systems uh, which are uh, aimed uh, at uh, political systems. Uh, and this, in the same way, federalism is closely related to democracy. Here, however, we we encounter a problem related to two concepts of democracy. Let me start by saying that uh, after World War II, we saw a shift in the understanding of democracy. Uh, before the war, 
uh, the Fox Populi or the voice of the people uh, and the suggestions of the French Revolution were uh, prevalent in, uh, uh, in the treatment of any democracy. We might remember this from the works of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and how he considered these uh, relations between an individual and the political world. And I could also quote other uh, political uh, authors. And when the uh, um, metropolitan powers abandoned uh, the colonies, they usually left behind uh, well thought uh, political systems and arrangements which had been developed in London, Paris, and elsewhere. However, the dogmatic following of such principles led to the undermining and, in some cases, the destruction of democracies because. Um, a democr democratic arrangement uh, would defeat the purpose of versatility and diversity, and not all problems of diverse societies may be uh, based uh, and resolved on the basis of the majority. Let us imagine a situation when a country uh, has uh, uh, um, uh, the minority will always lose. Uh, and uh, the democratic democracy would work, and those who are in minority shall always be um, uh, the losers, which indeed uh, led to a situation that in the 1960s uh, there was a wave of uh, military coups uh, whereby the frustrated minorities uh, uh, tried uh, to change um, the state of affairs to their benefit. The consequence. Uh, uh, of uh, such a uh, situation uh, was uh, the so-called democracy of the minorities, uh, where the respect for the minorities are indeed put uh, uh, to the fore, which indeed gave a new impulse, a new stimulus uh, to the federative uh, principles. In other words, the uh, Right, the um, concept of one person, one vote was amended, and federalism started to be viewed as a way to overcome the minority complex. And so that the minor groups are viewed as something more influential, more powerful than they really are, which allows these minority groups to come to terms to their, to their uh, uh, little. Uh, status. As you can see, um, and this was indeed one of the reasons uh, for the principles of federalism proclaimed for the Soviet Union and later for Russia, uh, which is a good way to stabilize the political situation. Here, however, we see a different problem. We talk about this problem a lot on a constant basis. True, the ethnic federalism is a risky enterprise because ethnic group living uh, on the same territory and the federalism. The federalism does two things it prevents the danger of secession uh, and makes it more possible because it limits. Uh, of states, of all the states are uh, there for ethnic groups. Uh, it's compromises of, uh, compromise of this federalism uh, is the brief uh, solution of, of problems. Uh, the demands of these minorities may be escalated when we protect ethnic subjects of the federation. Uh, we may skip the development of uh, nationalist regimes and uh, ethnic federation is hard to be reformed uh, and this is so and you pay special attention to this particular moment and my statistics show the following picture out of 18 federations of the type which existed during the 20th century and in the beginning of this century eight were disrupted and in one of them, Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia, five of them were centralized, like Pakistan and Russia. One uh, federation is managed by the UN, is Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
in the new four and by ethnic federalism with democracy. The list is here in Belgium, India, Canada, and Spain. I included Spain in this list and I take risks because actually officially Spain is not considered to be a federation. But uh, Spain uh, is always Spain has always been mentioned in this list. Actually, I know we deal here with the federalism, but it's not fixed in the Constitution due to certain serious historic reasons related to the specificity of Spanish history and bad memory left by federalism. Um, but federalist uh, ways of political life are definitely present. A few words about two cases related to uh, national federation territories to show that our Russian situation is not hopeless. We are national territorial federation, but that's not a catastrophe uh, like Vladimir Zhirinovsky says. Canadian Federation originated in 1867. And it has certain specificities. There are two groups uh, English speaking majority, and the group represents the victors, and another group which was defeated during the colonial war. That's French speaking group. And this imprints all the life of this state. And this state constantly finds out relationships between these two uh, communities. French speaking Quebec is always considered as a destabilizing element. And uh, Quebec uh, sometimes misbehaves. And imperial uh, British authorities do not like it, and English speaking majority of Canada uh, doesn't like it too. When the World War I started, uh, there were anti military movements uh, in Quebec. These people didn't want to go and fight for British Empire to Europe. And they said that we have nothing to do with these people from Great Britain. Why should we do it? And there is really a, a reputation in Quebec. They are always against. In the 60s, there was a quiet revolution in Quebec. Quebec political activists named themselves White Negroes of America. And they said that together with Negro population, they are oppressed. And that's awful. Uh, Quebec separatists. I uh, started talking about secession and they were saying that they want to develop their own political existence. Uh, English speaking Canada started developing its own response and uh, there was uh, something that uh, shows that Canada should secede from Quebec. How long should we tolerate? Some unsatisfied uh, province uh, asking for a special society of distant society. How much, uh, for how long should they be out of here? Let them secede. There were presidents uh, in the world. Singapore uh, is a piece of former Malaysian Federation in the 60s. Uh, federa the Malaysian Federation uh, took a decision to throw away. Uh, this piece and to cut it away. Uh, but in October 95, in Quebec, there was a referendum uh, with participation of 4.5 million voters. The issue was whether Quebec should secede from Canada. Canada was saved by 50,000 votes then. Uh, and there was a certain uh, problem because if there are 4.5 million voters, what is 50,000? This map shows the territory of Quebec. And this is not 15% uh, of territory and 25% of the population. If Quebec secedes, the future of Canada is at stake. 
when you model the situation with secession and departure of Quebec, all this script is uh, followed by the disintegration of Canada. But National Territorial Federation is uh, not a final punishment. Quebec wanted uh, constitution to be called a special or separate society, a distant society. Uh, Quebecs are Canadians, but different. That's what they want. They are minority, and as a minority, they need certain special rights. Canada resisted to this because nine tenths of the country thought that Canada was the union of equal provinces. And Quebec said, no, this is the union of two uh, linguistic and cultural groups, French and English speaking groups. And there can't be any equality. There is a group of minority and a group of majority, and minority needs the right to be respected. Uh, the referendum uh, made people reconsider former assessments, and this is a conflict of two versions of the Federation. Now, Canadians do not think that Quebec uh, requires a uh, status of special uh, of special territory, and uh, Quebec received uh, special competences. And the country remained the same, it grew even stronger. So sometimes you have to pay for the strength of federation by its asymmetry. It, it's not awful. Here we have two uh, quotations uh, by political leaders, Prime Minister of Canada, uh, and a federalist, Pierre Leo Trudeau, and the second is leader of uh, Quebec separatists. And you see, uh, that there are, at this point, so you are not exactly opposite. Another interesting case, the Federation, which is a national territorial federation, we don't know much about it, but it's interesting. This is Nigeria. Nigeria was built by Great Britain. They built a Nigerian federation in time of a colonial in the colonial time, then the country was left with federal constitution, and Nigeria is a pretty, pretty different society. There are 400 ethnic and linguistic groups, a great number of languages, but in this diversity, there are core groups, three large ethnic groups, and they cover 65% of the population. In England, to somehow save these groups from competition, each one of these groups should have its own status uh, inside the Federation. So it was the union of three states with a federal capital. But in the 60s, the northern Muslims used the uh, federative idea to start a war, uh, fighting for the federal center, then they used the majority and the federal center was controlled by them uh, together with its money and uh, other subjects were upset. As a result, uh, there were set events in the rule of the federation, no subject may overwhelm the others, but that's what happens in Nigeria, and Nigerian authorities tried to do something. And the first idea was to make more states so that they do not fight against each other. There should be other groups uh, as subject of the federation. And they started doing it, but it was too late because civil war started in the country. It was bloody war. One of the ethnic groups formed the Afra state and wanted to secede uh, from the Nigerian Federation. 1.5 million people were killed. It was in the 67, 70 of the last century. 
this map shows the territory that wanted to see, see Biafra, he said the bots. So each group uh, was created its own state. So the states were multiplied. In the 60s, there were three. In the 67, there were 12. In the 70s, there were 19. In 89, 21. Then 30, and then 36. Uh, this is an absurd method because you have 400 groups, and you can't imagine 400 subjects of the Federation. But this paradigm, this method, brought about positive results. Uh, in the long run, no one lost sovereignty. It was just added to someone. Authorities uh, administratively started to divide one ethnic group into several subjects of the Federation. So one ethnic uh, had more than one state and more than one republic, two, but two or three. As a result, uh, political identity was given to several subjects. And when there are so many groups, uh, it is uh, a mix up, and the more uh, groups, uh, the more uh, ethnic elements. So the large ones cannot preserve the power and political competition disappears and turns into administrative competition. Uh, when you fight for federal money, following more civilized ideas than ethnic loyalty. In the long run, Nigerian is, is not such a bad thing. Donald Gorowitz wrote a book Ethnic Groups in Conflict somewhere in the 80s. And he said components of Nigerian Federation are formed on the basis of historic tradition and not because of some risk ethnicity and confession. This mix is to guarantee uh, that in case of uh, confessional conflicts, uh, all local authorities would be able to settle the problem down without any escalation of the problem. So national territorial federations, uh, this is uh, this is still a possibility. And this is not something final and nobody is doomed. There are legal frames and these frames do not work the way they should. So you have to be prepared to the following situation. If legal norm is not, uh, has not died, if it was frozen, then it will wake up. Uh, how it will wake up? This is a uh, guess. You have to think about it. Norms wake up in a different way. Uh, and this is the right of free departure from the Soviet Union. Uh, the norms wake up and show their unusual sides. Uh, what will happen when Russian federalism uh, wakes up? Well, uh, let us consider Brazil a military regime in this country in the 60s to 85 did not annihilate the federal constitution, it left it. And in in Brazil, governors were elected by local parliaments. They were elected figures. Political competition was eliminated, and there were different parties which competed uh, with uh, each other. And one of them was United Brazil, now it was just Brazil, but the political competition was quite limited, but it was there. And when the uh, military regime at the top fell through, it turned out that local political bosses, local governors, uh, proved to be the most legitimate political actors in all the country. It was difficult for the center initially because uh, they tore the uh, federation apart. And that was the waking up of the Brazilian federalism. And he needed time 
to limit uh, this waking up some forward patterns. What will happen in case of Russia? When the Russian terrorism wakes up, uh, we should not expect anything good because we do not have political, normal political parties which support the Federation. We don't have civil society, we don't have independent court, we don't have uh, free mass media, we don't have political competition. So uh, there will be a bargain uh, which would question the existence of the Federation. If uh, something like this happens, the Federation is doomed. It would not stand. And this is very dangerous. Uh, political conclusions. Maybe we should bury federalism while it is not too late, or we, start, we have to start to improve it. But there is no such a uh, dilemma because ethnic federalism is not uh, for good reasons uh, in our country. Uh, to retain unity of the country uh, in any other way is not possible because 20% of ethnic minorities in Russia leave no other uh, form of political organization to hold the federation. So it's not whether federalism is good or bad, uh, but we have to think whether it has any alternative, but there is no alternative because the federation is not paradise and the election of the federative organization for a country like Russia, it is an inevitable choice because federalism is not uh, to turn the uh, life into a paradise. Uh, it should not turn our life into inferno. So when we uh, restructure uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the international community imposes federative recipes, thinking that this is the only way to somehow pacify the communities and stabilize the situation. The same is true about Russia. I am nearing completion. So we come up uh, to the uh, paradoxical situation uh, with the Russian federalism. And this is the town uh, which is uh, on top of the mountains. And Russian federalism uh, is also of dubious nature. It's very really difficult. And, uh, and you can't say no to it. Uh, authoritarian uh, regime does not foster federation approaches. And ours is the authoritarian society. But our federalism does survive because uh, such regimes use uh, uh, federation regimes as an instrument of territorial expansion. And this is the explanation of this paradox. William Riker in the 60s, an uh, American researcher of federalism, said that when colonial period was over, the federalism turns into the only way of uh, peacefully acquire new territories. If you want to make your country larger, you should be a federation, because federation is an open union. Theoretically, anybody can join. And this is an important factor why it is still there in Russia. And when uh, we uh, think why we do not turn into a unitary democratic republic, this is the reason. If you want to reintegrate the post-Soviet space, of course, the Federation is the natural way. We have constitutional law uh, on the appearance of new subjects of the Federation. This law provides for the procedure of territorial uh, uh, changes of territorial enlargement. This law uh, was used for the first time in 2008 when there was a war with Georgia, and uh, someone said that probably will uh, use this law to acquire certain territories. This didn't happen, but we saw how this non functioned, and it was quite recently. Federalism 
is not uh, used uh, the way it should be used uh, to improve situation with the minorities, but we use it in an expansionist way. So we use it for expansion. In the post-Soviet countries, the situation is more or less the same. Uh, federalism is not demanded to wear in the use or it will be obvious, like in Georgia. Unfortunately, in this country, federal recipes were not used, and now it's too late, and they lost some of their territories. The same is true about Moldova, Ukraine. So the question is, why post-Soviet elites did not use federalism? Uh, Bruno Capitals from Holland gives the answer. Uh, he studied the Southern Caucasus and said that federal recipes might pacify the tension uh, in the Caucasus, but they are not used. And he said that for all the countries in the region, the principle of indivisibility of the sovereignty is the last straw uh, just to survive. So this is the prioritization of sovereignty. And, uh, and an ability uh, to present the idea of divisibility of the sovereignty. Well, in the Soviet constitutional right was always saying that sovereignty is indivisible, and since it is indivisible, minorities cannot get any sovereignty. And when they start saying that they want something else, they are to be put in their place. And that's what happened in the 90s in many post-Soviet republics with different degree of success. So to live in the Federation, what does it mean? You have several avenues uh, of authority. You uh, redistribute how you spread uh, the power and limit it in this way. You harmonize political system, giving to the minorities the right to vote. You improve the dialogue and compromise, or encourage the dialogue and compromise. The initiative uh, in the separate, uh, in the different components of the country. So, do you live in the Federation now? Not exactly. And uh, this is a positive uh, conclusion. Uh, for uh, such a country, it's better to be a bad federation than a good unitary empire. Our uh, federalism is still sleeping. It is not dead. It is sleeping. With time, it will be on demand and it will be used to improve or renew the Russian society. And the future is good because it offers you different alternatives. And it will be there, I mean, the future will be there, and that's why uh, we uh, should be glad when you think about it when you are in the state of pessimism. Uh, when you find out that you wouldn't get any cucumber or uh, apples from Poland. <laughs> who helped me to illustrate uh, to illustrate my points. Okay. Colleagues, and that's the end of my presentation. And now I pass the microphone to our uh, Spanish colleague. Uh, and then we'll have our discussion. The session is enlarged. It's two hours. Because we have two specialists. So I think we will manage. It's Spanish language now.
it's a technical force. Evidently, English-speaking audience didn't expect the Spanish uh, 